they well, wanted for them. Maybe there was some other side of that. Well, somehow there was a lot of food there, so I thought that was helpful. And maybe Irina, that the, cause the following side event was by Irina in the UAE. Maybe they know. Yeah, I'm not sure. Anyway. So, maybe you should do a last call out to Ellen Cantor. No. I'll just forward her. Let's see if we can talk. I'll just forward her to the list because that's most of the people who are doing this. And also, we should get a picture of all of us afterwards for the yeah, respective yeah. websites. And For like going to PowerPoint, or is it going to PowerPoint? <laughs> no, I was I was almost gonna bring mine, but I thought they would be too yeah. much. So we're cool. probably gonna sit by to control yeah. ourselves. No? Yeah, no, that's what my yeah. So, oh, so, so the person that that's controlling it do we have remote will sit in the corner. So so they'll get up and do it so they can control yeah, 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 see yeah. the screen. Okay. But that's so why I said the one because this thing is one sit by the Oh sorry, I I missed what you said. That's that's it. We, we, we don't have remote. Seems it's fine. Oh. That's I'm already. Uh, you have started. I'm learning uh, the web broadcasting. It yeah. is streamed. Yeah. Uh, on, uh, okay. Uh, this time, I'm, I mean, we agree I think in Marrakesh that all of us use this. For, for the slides that you're learning on. Is, is this okay? Or? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Just I mean, yeah. Thank you. kind of yeah. excuse myself. I could be fucked up the AS good. Okay. Oh, good. well, in, in the next slide, there's Red Alliance, wow. ISIS, and then you go 100. Yeah. So all three are, are on the top there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Change the slide. I mean, anyway, we'll okay. Very well. We should uh, just see if the now if the, the platform is, is established. Yeah. And besides from the ITA, all right, and I partly agree to be member of the net. I think that makes it also then easier to kind of kind of see that we do the work in the Yeah, that's it's just going to have a, a uniform display message or yeah. format. Uh, yeah. uh, okay. So the relevance more on the not, yeah. practical side. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Where yeah. part of the red alliance or red alliance is part of the red alliance? No. Not one of them, but the members of the red alliance are part of the red alliance. They are, then they have a statement that you have to right? But you know, they didn't have yeah. a statement in the United States. Why would you do that? I introduced it to the vendor line and over to the platform. And I was told that it was the Yakutina and James on the platform. Yeah. Because then, yeah, I mean, for me, this platform we have now the four different groups. One is the environment NGOs, which are well as well as the environment NGOs. Then we have the we have uh, um, the local government, they they do this as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have science, but okay, ISIS is a bit bubble. Yeah. Right. yeah. It's, well, it's, it's still mainly yeah. scientific. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
How I would like to see my So red lines is probably not hard anyway. Then can that can help to shape the work and the network. All the work we can do is in the umbrella and water. Please don't be afraid to come close if you want to. We we won't bite, you know. <laughs> When I bet you Yeah. Wow. Well, I'm going to do Okay, hello everybody. Um, thank you very much for joining us today at the side event, staying below 1.5 degrees with 100% renewable energy. Um, the speakers today represent in the panel um, represent different um, organizations um, that uh, also deal with the issue of reaching 100% renewable energy. Um, all of us are um, engaged in the newly launched 100% uh, global 100% renewable energy platform. And uh, today we would like to share with you um, our um, uh, views on uh, how this uh, end can be achieved um, and to show that it is feasible, what the uh, obstacles might be, um, and also to introduce to you um, the newly launched platform. Um, so um, the speakers today are um, Steve uh, Mayers from um, International Solar Energy Society. We have um, Lasse Boone from Climate Action Network. Um, Stefan Gzenger from the World Wind Energy Association, um, Arthur Hinch, myself from Global 100% RE from the new launched platform. Um, we have Felix um, Arufi from uh, ICLE, Local Governments for, in, uh, for Sustainability. And uh, we also have a video message from Anna Leitreiter from the World Future Council. So without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Steve. First of all, thank you everybody for, for coming. I know it is Friday almost evening and Germany's famous for certain drinks, but thank you very much for, for sticking around for us here. So I would like to go out and try to show how renewable energy can help achieve the 1.5C goal. So first off, why 1.5C? Um, I'll show a bit of doom and gloom here, but we have ocean acidification, we have coastal flooding, we have drought and crop death, all which can be accelerated and greatly affect humans' way of, uh, way of life. So the question is, how do we stop this? How do we slow this down? And more importantly, how can renewable energy help to solve these problems? So first, I want to go into what does 1.5C mean? Um, so first, as we all are familiar with, what is the two degree goal? And I want to highlight here the yellow dot indicates where we are today, about 55 gigatons of CO2 emitted uh, last year. And so in the 2C goal, uh, to achieve only two degrees by the end of the century, we have to uh, reduce our CO2 emissions by about 14 gigatons in the next uh, 13 years. And then by 2050, we have to reduce it by half. And by the end of the century, scary as it may seem, we have to be carbon neutral. But that is possible. What's also possible is 1.5C, although we have to be a bit more aggressive towards it. So for 1.5, we have to do 17 gigatons by the end of the, uh, 2030. And then by 2050, you have to be reduced about 80% according to uh, UNEP. Um, other researchers also point out that by mid-century, we essentially have to be carbon neutral. And then from 2050 on, we have to be a net sink 
of CO2. That means we have to be actively taking carbon from the water, from the atmosphere, and putting it back into the ground. So how do we do this? Well, we use renewable energy. And we're going to go through, and on this graph here, we can just quickly see, um, this is one uh, researcher's estimate of the energy breakdown by 2100. Uh, on the x-axis is the years, and on the y-axis is the amount of energy produced by certain energy providers. So here we have solar, which is, he estimated, about 45%. Wind, about 10, 11, 12. And then bioenergy, 22. But as we are promoting 100% renewables, we, th we think that, sorry, 100% uh, renewables is obtainable with, with hard work and support from, from all of our colleagues. So once we know that we know, or once we know that solar and wind and biomass can achieve these carbon reductions, where exactly in industry and over the world can they be installed? Can they replace fossil fuels? Well, there are three main sectors which renewable energy can help to offset. This is electricity and, and, and heat, which we have here, which is about 25% of the emissions in the world right now, about 13 gigatons. Um, and these are indirect emissions. These are more where uh, coming from power plants, uh, electricity that we use in our homes and heat from district heating networks. Um, then we have the second largest, which is industry, about 21%, around 11 gigatons. And these are uh, things that pe people make, basically. We have, co uh, we have concrete, we have chemicals, we have metal, which are higher temperature applications. But we also have lower temperature things like making food products, uh, pasteurizing milk, m making paper. This is also a large um, energy use, which, which, which can be replaced with renewable energy. And lastly, as we all know, transport, which is a bit smaller, but, um, but is a very popular topic right now. This is all land-based land transport, which is cars and rails, um, sea-based with ships, and then air, obviously, with airplanes. So now that we know where to install these solar energy and these wind energy projects, I want to go through some, some case studies and examples of where these projects today are helping to reduce our carbon dioxide emissions. And it's also very important to, to note that renewable energy plays a very significant role in reducing CO2, but it cannot solve all the problems in the, in the world. There's a lot of other ways that we have to reduce CO2. So it is a partial solution, but still a very strong one. So first, I'd like to point out um, solar, large scale solar district heating. And this is a picture of a 110 megawatt uh, solar heating plant in Denmark, not the sunniest place in the world. But this is able to provide heat and hot water um, for, for this town for 20% of the year or 20% of their annual demand. And this can be easily increased with the use of, um, of thermal storage and building the, the field larger. And another project also in Denmark, they're able to achieve 50% of their heating demands through solar energy. And what's amazing about this project is that there, it is, there are no subsidies involved for solar thermal. It is 100% solar thermal versus the price of natural gas. So this is today, in the not very sunny country of Denmark, solar is beating natural gas, which is phenomenal. But also there's the question of, okay, 50% solar is good, but where's the rest, where's the 100? Well, hybrid systems, basically. Um, heating can be pro pro provided. Um, through heat pumps, which can be, pro, uh, which can be run uh, with excess PV and wind-generated electricity. They can also be supported with uh, biomass boilers um, to, to provide secondary heating when the sun is not always available. And lastly, in Denmark, due to the very high wind fraction there, uh, there's oftentimes a surplus of electricity, which is sold at a negative price to the market. And that's when you can use direct electricity to al also heat your process. And speaking of electricity, uh, as we all know, solar is 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 big. Um, so PV over 300 gigawatts installed uh, total, 75 this past year, which is huge. Um, C C uh, CSP not as large, but still plays a key role in uh, regulating the grid and having thermal storage relatively cheap. Um, and the and the graph here shows a prediction of the cost of electricity produced by PV uh, from Fraunhofer. And we can see today um, costs are between five or fifty and hundred dollars per megawatt hour, predicted to go down between two and four cents by 2050, uh, which is already competitive with uh, natural gas and coal in the sunnier regions like India and the Middle East. However, 
projects are already going faster than the predictions. For example, um, there's a project in Abu Dhabi about one gigawatt or one terawatt, um, or sorry, one one gigawatt um, that is already being uh, that will be built and produce electricity for less than thirty dollars per kilo per megawatt hour. It, this is ten years faster than predicted, and it's only going to show that PV is 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 only going to get cheaper and is only going to be installed in more and more places across the world. And this is in a place where natural gas is already very very cheap too. So this is a good shot for the future. Coming up next, uh, wind. Over 500 gigawatts have already been installed, about 10% in the past year alone. And just announced a couple weeks ago is a new project in Australia. At again, uh, US dollars cost about $40 per megawatt hour. And in reference to the last graph, cheaper than gas. And again, I'll, and Australia does have some cheap fossil fuel resources. So again, the, the price comparison is, is, is all already here. And when we talk about scale, um, there's a new project in planning right now um, in the North Sea called the North Sea Wind Power Hub. Um, this, is, this can potentially be up to a 100 gigawatt project with thousands and thousands of wind turbines installed in the North Sea, which are centered around this artificial island, which will be the main uh, voltage conversion hub to, to high voltage DC to ship um, electricity efficiently to the member countries of the UK, Norway, Denmark, Germany, and Holland. And it's amazing that this can serve up to 100 million people um, with renewable energy. Next up for, for industry. Um, this is close to, to my heart. I'm doing my PhD on this right now. Um, so solar heat can also generate um, steam for industrial processes. This is the picture here is from Jordan. It serves a pharmaceutical company and, and meets 30 to 40% of their steam demand to, to generate their there are drugs basically. This is a, a concentrated solar device, and this can easily be, be used in, in many sunny countries. And what's also great is when you use steam, this is used in thousands and thousands of different factories across the world. So it's a very flexible technology and can be built to scale. Coming up next is, is, a, is a huge plant in Chile for, for copper processing. This is 30 megawatts here, which has an 80% solar fraction because they have a very large thermal storage. And what's great, again, this project also had 0% funding from the government. This is a sheer competition, solar versus uh, diesel in, in this case. To be fair, uh, diesel has to be trucked in, and it's fairly expensive relative to, to other places. But again, this is a prime example of where solar is already cheaper than, than fossil fuels and is being used today to, to reduce CO2. And also, again, we come to the question of, well, what happens when the sun doesn't shine? Well, there is thermal storage, but biomass is always a possibility to serve as a backup heating source to further reduce the CO2 emissions. Uh, lastly, coming to, to transport, um, EVs are, are becoming more and more popular. Uh, Teslas, they are, they are great, um, a bit too expensive, but, um, but they're gaining in popularity across the world. And PV and wind generated electricity can, can greatly uh, provide the main electricity source to these vehicles, um, especially helping to balance out the grid when there is a peak surge in PV and wind generation. Uh, biofuels are also being pursued for, for heavier transport. In the sea, what uh, we, we used to travel across the sea using wind power, and now apparently what's old is new again. Um, co uh, uh, companies are now investing in wind sails to actually support their, their cargo ships across the world, helping to reduce their fuel consumption by up to 30%. Uh, biofuels are also playing a role here with, uh, with reused food oil as a, as a byproduct. Uh, lastly, uh, with air, uh, biofuels are the main um, option here, and there are two interesting projects going on. One is uh, in conjunction with Maslow Institute, um, with an Etihad Airways, along with a couple other um, companies is the growth of salicornia in an aquaculture system. And salicornia is a salt loving plant that produces an oil rich seed. And they're currently undergoing testing in Abu Dhabi to, to grow this crop using quote unquote useless sand and salt water to produce biofuel. Uh, they're also doing the same in Singapore, although reusing cooking oil to make jet fuel. So it's really great full, uh, full circle way to, uh, to make jet fuel. Lastly, this is, this is uh, I think, an interesting development here is how do you grow crops in salt water and in the desert? 
well, you don't until these two companies came around. Um, here, the, Sah the Sahara Forest Project, which is on the left-hand side, which is originally based in Qatar, currently uh, doing a project in Jordan. And on the right-hand side, we have Sunjob Farms based in Australia. These companies have used concentrating solar thermal and PV to, to generate electricity and then to desalinate the salt water that's locally available to feed the then fresh water to uh, the tomato and cucumber crops. And while this may seem like a, a cool application, but not really practical, to give you some scale here, this Sundrop Farms project, it provides 15% of the tomatoes in Australia today. And that is not any small, small project right there. So this is amazing what they've done, turning unfertile saltwater land into a place where you can grow food, uh, fruit and vegetables. And with that, I'd like to conclude uh, Renewable Energy, part of the 1.5C solution. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Steve Myers. And if you have interest to come to Abu Dhabi, we're hosting the Solar World Congress this year at the end of October, early no November. And we have brochures out on the table if you're interested. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry. And our next speaker, sorry. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Also, a big thanks for me for sticking with it. The graveyard shit, uh, shift of the of the well, for it didn't slip there of the of the first week of the the Substar. Thank you so much for staying here this late. My name is Lasse. I'm from Climate Action Networks, which I'm assuming most of you will know. Uh, if not, ask me in the break. I won't ask, spend time on describing it here. Uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit more from a macro perspective as opposed to what Stephen was talking about now. I'm going to talk a little bit about urgency for the transition to 100% renewable energy. I'm going to be talking about the global movement, the global agreement. I'm going to be talking a bit about co-benefits and some thoughts on a way forward. First, a little bit about the urgency. Well, it was pretty well pointed out by Stephen, like you, you saw his graphs that described why we need to make things quite urgent now. But there are many different other, there are other issues to it as well. One of them is that uh, renewable energy is a key mitigator, which means when we're looking at the transition, renewable energy is one of the fast and pretty handy uh, solutions we can uh, initiate straight away. But it also acts as a first mover. Uh, we know, all know there are many other issues we need to address uh, transportation more widely than energy only, agriculture, land use more, more generally, and so forth. Um, but our theory of change is that, you know, if we go with renewable energy first, this is something that's tangible, something people can relate to, it will then open the, the, the positive floodgates, so to speak. Um, it also is very quite urgent we, that we cement a rapid transition to 100% renewable energy as quickly as possible to stop new explorations. We all know what's going around, going on right now, particularly in the US, particularly looking at the Arctic, uh, pending explorations. The sooner the solution that, and the pathway to 100% renewable energy is in place, the less likely it's going to be that those explorations are going to get the green light to go ahead, which we should give uh, high uh, importance. And also, um, new threats emerge every day. Again, Stephen touched upon hurricanes and floods and stuff like that. And um, as you will also have seen, some of you, even new diseases or actually old diseases come about. Uh, some of you might have seen the new news from the World Economic Forum talking about the, the melting of the ice actually gives space to carcasses and other placeholders for, for bacteria such as the anthrax, the bubonic plague, and other issues that actually are in a concrete risk of starting up again. And we do not have the anti antibodies to, to actually deal with that because it's ancient diseases, so to speak. So no matter where we look, climate change is really a downer. Also, um, we see great developments, you know, like the tomato installation in Australia and other issues and the general transition to 100% renewable energy is moving ahead, which I'll get back to momentarily, but we're still not doing it fast enough. And also you will see that even like the presidency, Fiji uh, for this year is gonna be looking a lot on impacts from climate change because simply they are literally sinking right now. So the, the urgency is gonna be reiterated. And of course, we're gonna be talking about the urgency shifting to 100% renewable energy as a key mitigator. 
Global movement, global agreement. Well, uh, in the next video that's going to come up after me, it's going to be much more detail on the numbers, but you will have seen that several countries have already committed to 100% renewable energy. First and foremost, the Climate Vulnerable Forum that had 80, 48 countries last year officially state they wanted to transition to 100% renewable energy. Cities all over the world are coming up, particularly in response to uh, to dominant governments, as you were seen in the UK, so in the US, for instance, where the US is is failing to to uh, deal with climate change uh, from a federal perspective. Many cities and states as well are um, standing up to their responsibility. Businesses, we're seeing businesses all over the place committing to 100% renewable energy. Uh, there are many of them are affiliated with the so-called Climate Group, which is an umbrella organization that uh, creates incentive for businesses to transition to 100% renewable energy. And it's not small stuff. We're talking about Fortune 500 companies such as Mars, Ikea, Bloomberg, and so on. Um, and communities more widely, not just cities, but also smaller municipalities and communities around the world are uh, building up um, their pathway to 100% renewable energy. So things are moving. Of course, the Paris Agreement, I won't you know, spend too much time on that, but uh, the Paris Agreement states the desire to limit warning to no more than 1.5 by 2100. Mm -hmm. um, if you just uh, juxtapose that with the IPCC, they say, well, we need to end all, to do that, we need to end all CO2 emissions by 2050. And then we say, of course, one of the key things to do with that is transition to 100% renewable energy. So, of course, the Paris Agreement is the legal uh, basis on which we're working. And also millions of people around the world who are saying we want a, a, a climate-safe planet. You will have seen the, um, the People's Climate March in 2014 was a big kickoff for, for, for that. In 2015, there were massive demonstrations around Paris, and just a few weeks ago, we saw it again. And I don't think we should underestimate the, the people of the power, to use the cliche. Uh, it does make change. It does make a change when constituencies across civil society, businesses, gender, faith, development get together and actually take to the streets to say that they want to see action now. It is heard by the decision makers. A little bit about co-benefits, um, energy access. Well, for many, many places around the world, it's not a matter of transitioning to different kinds of energies, uh, actually having energy in the first place. And energies, uh, renewable energy systems is by far more suited to, to, to put rapid uh, decentralized energy systems in place than uh, fossil fuels. Health. Just to give you a number, these are U.S. number. The estimate is that between 2011 and 2012, around 100,000 people in the U.S. died from respiratory diseases affiliated with fossil fuels, primarily coal, which constitutes uh, 868 billion U.S. dollars for that year alone, or 6% of the GDP. So the health implications are massive, and also, as you can see from a financial perspective, um, great investments of investment opportunities for the transition as well. China, alone in 2014, uh, spent 89.5 billion, um, I missed the billion, that billion US dollars in China alone, and that number is just growing. Energy security and independence, there's a micro level and the macro level. Uh, the macro level is about ensuring that a uh, certain country becomes become, uh, independent in terms of uh, they don't need to rely on uh, import of fossil fuels. To, to run their, their um, to meet their energy demands, but they can produce it domestically. And at a much smaller scale, you will see that commu uh, communities, uh, cities, towns, villages can install um, renewable energy systems, uh, so solar or PV, uh, PV or wind energy. Mm -hmm. And in that way, they can uh, be much more reliant on what they produce themselves and do not need to hook up to a grid. And as I said before, it's much easier, easier to put that in place than to put them in place a, a coal factory, for instance, in a village. And it also gives them the independence uh, of controlling their own energy supply. Uh, economic strengthening, just one example, uh, the tax revenue from uh, re investments in renewable energy is quite substantial and it's growing. Uh, food security, well, we all know that processing fossil fuels uses a lot of water, your water that could be used for direct human consumption or for irrigation for crops. And often you'll see in, uh, in particular in uh, developing countries that there's a competition between water used for fossil fuels and for food production. And the more you shift to um, renewable energy, the more water can be used for irrigation for crops. And also those, uh, those RE systems you put in place, 
will then also drive, for instance, the irrigation systems, refrigeration, storage, cooling, or whatever it might be, that is going to be much more beneficial than having to rely on uh, on diesel, which is often the case, which is expensive as well. And gender equality, um, about 25% of, um, of uh, employees in the renewable energy bis, uh, sector are women, which is much more than across different sectors. Mm -hmm. So by and large, the renewable industry is also much more open to gender equality. And just one of the key things, uh, job creation, you'll see this graph here, it is from REN21, from their Renewables 2016 Global Status Report. Uh, and the numbers speak for themselves, like uh, currently, and it has grown since, we have 8.1 uh, 8 uh, million jobs specifically about renewable energy, which constitutes, as you can see, bioenergy, geothermal, hydropower, solar energy, and wind power. It is a massive, in, massive increasing business, increasing business, and by far outweighs ways any new jobs within the fossil fuel business, which I'll get back to in a second. A little bit about the way forward. Uh, first of all, leadership, leadership in many way, different ways in terms of politics and and so forth. One of them is about uh, so-called diffused leadership, uh, particularly with the U.S. failing to take their responsibility. You see many more other countries are stepping up and uh, taking that space, particularly China uh, and China working closely with countries and entities such as uh, India, uh, Mexico, Canada and the EU. Um, and also you will see one news that came out today is that uh, in June there's going to be a, a climate summit co-hosted by China and the EU, uh, which also is quite symbolic as opposed to the practicalities they're going to be discussing. Uh, business. Businesses, as I mentioned before, many businesses are converting to renewable energy. Either it's businesses that use a lot of power themselves or it's from their suppliers, third parties, for instance, which is the case for many food production companies. Um, things are moving pretty well ahead, but it's still not going fast enough. There are still too many barriers. Those can be informed uh, be, uh, in the terms of trade issues, but it can also be in terms of uh, lack of access to loans to do the transition, which still has to be uh, upped. Um, civil society, and I put here, catch the heads. Um, civil society needs to be much better at supporting uh, political leaders who are taking responsibility. So we see there's been a, for many years a lack of leadership and, and some governments are afraid to stick out their necks because if they do and makes a big transition, they might cut off their heads. And I think we as civil society need to be much better as actually standing there and letting them know that if the heads are cut off, we're going to try to catch them and glue them back on. We need to provide a much stronger safety net. It might be a bit silly, but the uh, I think you shouldn't underestimate the symbolism of demonstrating to political leaders that the people is actually with them because in essence that is their constituencies in the end. Um, in terms of where we're sitting now, we need to see much more ambition. We have the stock take, the facilitative dialogue next year, looking to see how we move on from the Paris Agreement, particularly looking to see what kind of NDCs can be put forward in, uh, in 2020. And uh, some countries are ambitious like the climate vulnerable forum countries I mentioned earlier, but we still have a long way to go. And also, we have to keep pointing out that to stay below 1.5, it is a prerequisite to transition to 100% renewable energy. Some renewable energy by 2050 is simply not going to cut it. It has to be 100%. Uh, making it a bit more concrete, uh, businesses, a lot of businesses are making their transitions, but a lot of them are looking at 2030, 2040. And I don't blame them for one, because they're trying to kind of match the political commitments on that one. But I think we need to push them to be a little bit more bold and, and uh, make some stronger commitments and have some small, stronger investments in the short term as well. Uh, roadmaps. The CVF, I've already mentioned them several times. I think it was a game changer last year in Marrakesh when the CVF countries came out, 48 countries, and said, we're going to transition to 100% renewable energy. So now that was the statement. Now we need to make it much more concrete. So it's also up to civil society specialists and the governments themselves, of course, to try to put in place proper roadmaps that can form the basis for decarbonization plan and eventually also the NDCs. Um, about energy efficiency, part of the transition as well, we shouldn't underestimate the, the, uh, the efficiency aspect as well. We need to focus on that a bit more, I think. And I uh, put ownerships moves to access. Uh, one of the issues is that if we 
by 2030, for instance, have uh, five billion electric cars provided by Tesla, and lots of electric batteries. That's not the solution we want because we cannot host that in terms of resources. What we need to look at as well is how do we make the in, uh, energy transition about efficiency that relates to in particularly a uh, modality change in transportation so that we ensure we move from from a uh, personalized individual transportation much more to affordable functional and uh, sustainable public transportation just a few uh, numbers that looks a bit scary and actually they are so there's an uh, iea uh, report that came out recently that stated that if you want to stay below 2.2 degrees um, we need to have an investment each year of like 1 trillion US dollars. Uh, and if we want to stay below uh, 1.5 degrees, we need to, we're looking at 1.5 to 2 trillion US dollars per year, which is not a small amount. So we need to get our act together. Just to compare it, uh, for the SDGs, it's estimated that to implement the SDGs over the next 15 years, it's going to take around uh, 90 trillion as a total number. And again, we need to keep saying in, in the light of what I've just said, it is not about if we need to transition to 100% renewable energy or how we do it is actually when, because it will happen. It's just a matter of like how we do it, sorry, when we do it. And the sooner we do it, the better. Uh, the next point, and I'm almost coming to an end now, is about the global approach. We need to have a much better global perspective. Uh, we're trying as a lot, and we, in, I mean, in terms of global community, trying to, to have much better distribution of renewable energy. However, often we, we, the point of departure is much, way too much anchored in a Northern Hemisphere uh, discourse and uh, setting in terms of practicality, demographics, uh, logistics, and so forth. And we need to be better at making those investments in the Global South, which leads to the next point, which is about South-South co collaboration. As an example, there might be a very good, uh, the solar installation in, in, uh, for tomatoes in Australia might be great there. It, it's, a, it's an arid area, uh, salt water, but if you take it to uh, a place in, in sub-Saharan Africa where there might be a more lush, a different system, it might not work there. Or if you look at uh, systems in Germany, for instance, on Denmark, which are very well functioning, they work because they have the infrastructure, the different setting, the climate and whatever. Um, but it might not work in Malawi, for instance. So we need to be much better looking at south-south uh, uh, sharing of, of uh, solutions to understand renewable energy. So systems in, in South and Sub-Saharan Africa, for instance, can be compared to some systems in South America, for instance. Uh, just transition is, is key. We need to make sure that everything we do in terms of, uh, of uh, this transition has to be just, which means we need to look at, at uh, job retention and uh, at do the job impact assessments that are necessary. Luckily, the good news is here that that the creation of renewable jobs, as I mentioned before, by far outweighs uh, job creation within the fossil fuel business. Um, but it's not without issues. If you look at, for instance, the some of the more energy consuming businesses such as uh, uh, steel, cement, paper mills or whatever, they are relying on very strong base loads. And Stephen talked about solutions for that, but there's still some nervousness within the uh, uh, those big uh, uh, entities and within the, the workers' unions generally about whether the base load for this energy can can be met by renewable energy. So there's still some work to be done there. Also, everything we're doing on in terms of renewable energy shift has to be anchored within the SDGs and development. And also, it is very much a social and, and justice issue. We have to, to keep that in mind. Uh, my last and second to last slide here, we need to normalize the narrative. We need to make it real to people, right? So we need to be much better at knowing our audience and speaking to them. Uh, we can, I can speak to you in this way, um, but I, maybe I shouldn't speak to the same in the same way when I speak to my friends. Or maybe if I give a presentation in the plenary, I need to use a different language. It's not just about the language, the messaging, it's about the overall narrative and how we address it. Uh, and I think we need to become better, particularly civil society in, in how we do that. And just to mention it, renewable energy used to be a hippie thing, now it's a bit more hipster thing, but it shouldn't be. It should just be very common sense. It's just logic to do the transition. And again, to highlight again, repetition always works in communication. We have to stay below 1.5. Uh, if we want to do that, 100% RE is the prerequisite. Just a final two, two slides I want to show you here, which is um, things are happening. So I'm gonna, stopping on a positive note. Last year in Marrakesh, uh, there was a big side event arranged and this was an unprecedented 
event uh, in the terms that had uh, representatives from all sectors. It was hosted by the COP presidency, so Morocco, co-hosted by the Climate Vulnerable Forum countries with the uh, uh, UNDP, uh, so development, and the Sustainable Energy for All as the co-sponsors. And then a plethora, as you can see, a plethora of uh, uh, civil society organizations, businesses, investment organizations, and so forth. All of them getting together and having one unified uh, message, which is the transition to 200% renewable energy is needed if you want to stay below 1.5. So if we manage to put these people together in an event like this, it gives me hope that in the coming years we can see a much stronger uh, movement across all sectors working together to this. I think we have a breakthrough coming slowly. And that's it I wanted to say. Thank you. So next up, we have a video contribution from Anna Lightwriter from the Bold Future Council. Hello, my name is Anna Lightwriter. I work for the World Future Council. And the World Future Council is an organization that works internationally on policies. So our main mandate is to identify policy solutions that have proved successful across the world. So for my field, that would be renewable energy and climate protection. And one of the policy measures that really proved successful were 100% um, renewable energy targets. Renewable energy itself is a technology that provides solutions, but what is the policy framework that actually enables us to harvest these benefits? And there are several legislations like feed-in tariffs that already help to increase the share of renewables. But how do we actually make us independent, unlock us from the fossil fuel resources on this planet. And the only way to do that is to set 100% renewable energy targets. So I'm speaking today to you about the global movement of 100% renewable energy pioneers that you can find really on all continents. More than 50 cities across the world have set 100% renewable energy targets. Many of them actually with a remarkable size, just to name a few of them, Frankfurt, Vancouver, Sydney, Copenhagen, and islands like El Hierro in Spain or Samsur in Denmark, or just recently Hawaii in the US, have become a trendsetter in this movement. Because for them, being independent from energy imports is actually quite a cost-effective solution. They are at the forefront of climate change because they really feel the impacts already on the islands with raising sea level and uh, extreme weather events. So taking action and 100% renewable energy is that kind of action is really important for them. Finally, whole nations like Cap Verde, like Denmark, Iceland, Sweden, Costa Rica, they all prove that renewable energy technologies are viable to power our societies. Now, this is a very encouraging movement, and it's actually quite exciting to speak to these people who are managing these transitions and who have done these transition plans to implement their visions. The organization I work for, the World Future Council, we are analyzing these policy frameworks from these pioneers and see what can we learn from them and what can others maybe replicate in their jurisdictions. So we have looked at some of these uh, jurisdictions that I actually just mentioned. And indeed, there are five policy recommendations uh, that we can draw from that. And the first one, make energy efficiency a top priority. So energy efficiency is part of the equation, and this is something that many people forget. Moving towards 100% renewable energy 
also means looking at how do we consume the energy? How is the inf infrastructure of our energy system um, developed at the moment or established at the moment? And how can we make it more efficient to reduce the amount of energy we need to produce from renewable energy sources? Secondly, electrify the heating and cooling and the transport sector. We often forget that 100% renewable energy is not only about power, it's not only about the electricity that we consume. Actually, the larger share of our energy is used in the heating and cooling and in the transport sector. But make sure that this electricity for the transport sector does not come from coal and oil and gas and nuclear power plants, but actually from renewable sources. So it's important to look at the, the chronological order of this. Third um, policy recommendation is actually really close to my heart and something that I want to talk a little bit more in detail um, at the end of this presentation, which is to maximize the benefits for people and businesses and local governments. So engage them and develop new business models to ensure that the benefits are shared among many and not only among few. This means that Policymakers on the different national levels need to develop policy frameworks, legislations, which include new actors in the energy sector, rather than strengthening only those who are already in the market for many decades. And this goes hand in hand with the fourth policy recommendation that I would like to share with you, which is educating and informing citizens and businesses about the opportunities and the, op and the possibilities to engage and uh, to educate about renewable energy as a new technology um, in our society. And finally, that goes to all the policymakers out there, adapt an integrated approach to fiscal, economic and energy policy. Many people think 100% renewable energy, this is dealt with in the Ministry of Energy or sometimes Ministry of Environment. But what we actually need to see is a policy dialogue, an inclusive and integrated approach across different sectors that look at how can we enhance renewable energy? For example, taxation plays a huge role and is usually dealt with in a different department. Um, and only through that we reach a coherent and successful 100% renewable energy strategy. Good, thank you, Anna. Um, so up next we have a presentation by Stefan Gesenger on the topic of community power. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think that was already kind of preparing, well, um, the topic of my speech. Okay, um, so my name is Stefan Xenger. I'm the Secretary General of the World Wind Energy Association. This is kind of my first job. I'm also uh, uh, proud to be uh, one of the uh, founding executive committee members of the Global 100% Renewable Energy Platform, uh, which has become really an, an, a very important uh, also network for us to uh, exchange ideas and also kind of uh, uh, um, talk with our colleagues about our experience and how we look into this. Um, of course, coming from a wind energy association, I just want also to start with a slide about the global statistics on wind energy so that you can see what we have already achieved. Uh, we started in the year 1980. This is when we started with the statistics or when we could get the first statistics when wind energy was really almost, I mean, um, using wind power for power generation. Uh, the first prototypes were uh, installed. We had eight megawatt global wind capacity. And um, end of the year 2015, this is uh, this uh, slide ends, is, it was 435,000 megawatt. Uh, at this point of time, we will be at around 500,000 megawatt. So that's a great success story. Wind covers now around 5% of the global electricity demand. Um, this is, of course, still just the beginning. Uh, on the one hand, uh, we will have to see, of course, more wind energy, but also more other renewable energy technologies. Uh, the more wind we have, we can see this in some countries, 
the better we need to uh, think of and find technical solutions of integration, combining wind energy and other technologies. So I like very much this concept of the symphony of the renewables. So we need all the renewables indeed to provide the energy that humans need. And it's a little bit like uh, in an orchestra where you have different instruments. Um, yes, indeed. Um, you can play different music, so that's like the country or regional or local context uh, in which we are. Um, all the uh, technologies are available. There's abundance of renewable resources available, but we need to combine renewables in the appropriate way. There is harmony, that we would call it in, in, in music, or that technically we get the energy that we need. And I think Stephen already provided you some nice examples. Um, I want to rather uh, look into the like uh, social aspects of this. Um, as I said, proudly uh, to be part of this launch of this global 100% renewable energy platform, which is part of the whole story and for us really very important uh, because it brings together the different stakeholders. We as renewable energy associations are part of that uh, climate action network with uh, representing civil society is a very important partner that we can also exchange what are the best strategies? What are the best ways forward? And we agreed on kind of mainly two basic principles. This is something I also want to refer to. One is that um, we need an immediate switch to renewables. And we discussed time frames, but for sure, it, new investment should only be done in renewable energy. Um, secondly, and this is something I want especially to highlight here, we need a bottom-up approach. Um, there are um, several reasons for that. Uh, but one reason is also this diversity of technical approaches that we need because every place needs, needs its own kind of combination, its own symphony. And the people who are living at these places, they know best how to do it. So um, we are, for that reason, especially working on a concept that is now known as community power. Some languages, like in German, it's used uh, using the term citizens, power, burger, wind would be in, in, in German, which basically refers to local ownership of renewable energy installations. Um, this is very important in countries like Germany here, uh, where we have a lot now, especially from wind perspective, to deal with there's some places where there's local opposition against wind farms. Uh, but this is in particular the case where on visitors coming from outside the village. If the village itself as a community decides we put up a wind farm there, we want to generate our own power, we want to earn money with it, they're more than happy. And these people often are not only those who need to be encouraged, but they are the drivers. We see this in, in, in many constituencies around the world, that it's the politicians which um, are to be convinced by those people. So this is, um, uh, let me uh, call it in the industrialized country context, but it's even more the case, of course, in developing country context, when we have the big challenge of, or it's not anymore the question, I think uh, Lasse made it very clear, whether to go for renewables, it's the only option that we have, but how to overcome all these barriers that we have there, especially in terms also of finance. And we see that if investment takes place mainly community focused, then this challenge is easier to overcome. For example, focusing on a community, what are the needs, what are the economic activities? How can a community generate more income by owning, operating, so which kind of economic activities can be boosted by having access to electricity, for example. So I would um, put it short, community power means mainly maximizing the social benefits of renewable energy. In a country like yeah, European countries, that would be maximizing um, the benefits of this switch. That means a change in players and all the, the uh, also political the politics behind and the conflicts that we have. Um, in other countries, it means enabling access to modern energy services. So community power means maximizing the social benefits. We try to come to a definition of what community power is, and we, had, uh, we have a, a working group with people from all over the world, from all continents, but also from developing and industrialized countries alike, came to three criteria which seem to be important. Uh, who owns that installation, who gets the benefits, and who has the voting control. And uh, we agreed that if two out of these three criteria are fulfilled, then 
uh, we would call it a community power project. Um, the benefits of community power are very clear. Uh, there are a few studies around which also try to quantify that. That is, of course, easy in terms of, for example, job creation. That's very clear. Something that is a bit more difficult to measure, but we also have now scientific evidence for that, that, of course, uh, the acceptance and support for the switch to renewable energy that we urgently need is much, much higher if renewable energy is based on local communities. Added value for the region, of course, it's very clear when you look at, let's see, I, I'm just coming back from Sweden, um, Sweden, Denmark, north of Germany. The farmers, they earn money now from energy generation. It's not the international investors which own a share of nuclear power station and then the money goes to London and then it goes wherever, we don't know. It's the people, the locals who have the profit and they reinvest it also locally. Mm -hmm. If you look at countries like uh, one country we work with is Mali, um, it is possible that the people have the income and then they can reinvest it. That it allows really to get out of poverty. Poverty, of course, in financial terms. So there are many, many uh, positive, obviously, uh, impacts of community renewable energy. And uh, we as WWA, we have been working on that since now almost yeah, 10 years. We had our first World Wind Energy Conference with the special topic of community power in the year uh, 2008 in Canada. Um, and since then time, we also have a, uh, a working group on that. Um, we are on the global level the only organization working on that. So we're trying not only to focus on wind, but also uh, working with other uh, technologies. And I'm also very pleased um, to tell you that we've been able to uh, make it part of the ARENA agenda where there will be a um, subgroup on community energy investors. It's been discussed to set up a uh, business investors group. So we said, okay, if there's a business investors group, let's not only talk about the big corporations. They should be there, fine, but we must make sure everybody is there. So it will be a subgroup on community energy, which I think will be very, very important also for the work of ARENA in general. Um, the big question here, and I think Anna made some uh, more general remarks on that, uh, which policies are supportive, which policies are supportive for renewable energy in general. But what we can see is that those policies which are supporting community power investment, they help everybody. So we can see again that those policies which are helping communities that they will help us to reach the 100% renewable energy globally and then finally um, to, well, keep the, the Paris Climate Change Agreement. So feed-in tariffs in the case of power have been very effective, but we can see now that there's strong pressure on that and there's a very strong global trend against that. So we have already now come to that situation that there is a big competition that uh, many um, investors try to squeeze out other groups of investors. So this is something that we really need to look into. This is not just for the power uh, uh, sector. And there we can see that the, what is now globally on the way is rather squeezing out the small investors. That's really something that we're worried about and we're certainly uh, happy to uh, discuss with everybody how we can kind of stop this trend. Something that I believe uh, we do not really have the right answer uh, in terms of policies is the integrated solutions. Stephen again mentioned it. That's a, you also talked about it. Anna mentioned it. We need integrated solutions, not only the different renewable technologies, but also the different sector, sector coupling. There, on the one hand, we do not really have the instruments yet developed, but I think there are some ideas on the table. But I do believe that if we start looking into this from the local level, be it local governments or local communities, they, for them, it would be much easier to find the solutions that they need locally. That doesn't mean that we don't need any regional, national, global solutions, but starting there and whatever can be done there and then go to the next level, I think that should be the main uh, um, uh, strategic, strategic approach. Um, we started last year the first World Community Power Conference, which took place at a very symbolic place in Fukushima City. And it was on the invitation of the mayor of Fukushima who came to 
um, a conference which was actually co-hosted by the previous 100% network. Now it is a platform, a legal entity. And um, that event concluded with the so-called Fukushima Community Power Declaration, which you can also find on our website, on the website of the conference still, um, which kind of tries to identify the policies and, and, and the elements of the strategy which are important, but without doubt that community power community can do it alone. So we also hope that uh, this approach, and I think there it's starting now, um, we will see more awareness also in other uh, policy places like, for example, here in the climate change community. The next World Community Power Conference will take place in Mali, in an African country with, of course, with a completely different background, not so much focused on like investing, or rather wealthy people investing in, in, in a wind farm, but really rural electrification, how that can be done. So with this, I thank you for your attention and then hand over to Artra. Okay, well, thank you very much, Stefan. Um, is it? Um, so, um, uh, during all those uh, presentations we had up to now, uh, you uh, sometimes saw this logo, which is shown now on the slide on the bottom right side. This is the official logo for the newly launched Global 100% Renewable Energy Platform. My name is Arthur Hinch. I'm the coordinator of this newly established legal entity. And uh, what the platform does, it combines all the expertise, all the knowledge, all the um, um, special uh, well, expertise that, that, that uh, organizations or member organizations carry into one coherent uh, platform in order to enable us to spread the feasibility of 100% renewable energy around the world and to speak with one voice. So Stefan Gesenger, uh, no, sorry, um, I think, yeah, Stefan Gesenger earlier mentioned that um, there is a symphony of renewable energies um, needed. And I would also um, like to point out that in this platform, we have a symphony of organizations that come together and um, jointly pursue this very um, feasible and a very important goal of reaching 100% renewable energy. So on this slide, I'm quickly summing up um, what or has been said um, uh, in the previous presentations. Um, we uh, see that all over the world we have uh, many, many initiatives on the local scale, on the national scale, um, that are that are uh, targeted targeting this 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 100% renewable energy uh, goal, and really want to put their back into achieving this. Um, so this is something you saw uh, in Anna Lightwriter's presentation already. Um, this is the interactive map that we have on our website, www.go100re.net. Um, this is an interactive tool that shows all uh, different, in, in, all kinds of different initiatives around the world at this moment currently, uh, especially local government initiatives um, that pursue a 100% renewable energy target. This is an interactive tool. It can be uh, individually um, changed uh, depending on what exactly, what kind of initiative you're looking for. And uh, it's already substantial and we invite um, all stakeholders engaged in this topic to uh, expand on this. And uh, we look forward to expanding this ourselves as well. Um, so as uh, Stefan Zenger uh, mentioned already, um, last Monday um, we had the pleasure of coming together in, in the Gustav Stresemann Institute here in Bonn to officially launch the Global 100% renewable, renewable Energy Platform. Um, just a quick um, recap, the platform is does not come from, any, from, from, from nowhere, but it, in fact um, has been an ongoing initiative um, since 2013 in form of the Global 100% Renewable Energy Campaign. And uh, many of these organizations have already engaged in joint projects, engaged in, in, in holding joint side events, um, conferences um, to spread this message and to speak with one voice. Um, as you can see here, these are our founding members. Um, 
by having this broad range of members, we can effectively, effectively um, cover many different spectra, spectrums of um, what is necessary to achieve this goal. So it's local government level, it's organizations um, engaging in community power, that Stefan Gesenger talked about. We have the Fraunhofer ISA, we have Institute for Solar Energy Society, which focus very much on the scientific um, aspect of achieving this. We have organizations um, like uh, Mali Focus Center from Mali, which also focus on community power um, and uh, many more. Um, so this is the picture you already seen, have already seen uh, before in Stefan's presentation. Um, this has been the official launch. Um, the apparently white blank paper you see me holding there with a smile on my face is not blank, but actually contains the founding signatures of um, our of representatives of our founding members. Um, the way the organization is set up that we have an executive committee and we have uh, options for membership and we have options for members to engage in this platform to exchange expertise, um, but also to amplify that this is actually feasible. So we are actually the first multi-stakeholder platform on 100% renewable energy in the world. And um, we very much look forward to expanding this initiative to attract more members uh, and to um, jointly spread our message. Um, so um, the reason this has been launched as well as the platform is, is it has become a legal entity, which means we are officially uh, an eingetragener Verein, so a legal entity in uh, a nonprofit in, in based in Bonn and uh, can operate accordingly. Um, the platform is based on our guiding principles and um, of course this uh, entails that um, investments um, have to be 100% renewable energy based immediately, uh, that we want to achieve 100% renewable energy in power, heating, cooling and transport sectors on a global scale and very, very importantly, we want to focus on having a decentralized, people-centered approach um, as we really believe that this is a strong uh, aspect of reaching this transition and making this transition as socially inclusive as possible. Um, so this is what I talked about earlier. Um, we have currently two different uh, membership uh, options. We have our ordinary members, which our founding members are as well. What we do is we organize events, we engage regularly in conference calls to keep each other up to date. We jointly attract funding. Um, members can propose to agree, uh, to pr pr propose to um, um, add, contribute to the platform in a way that they see that were considered to be the most effective and ordinary members can elect the executive committee. In addition to that, we have supporting members. These are actually quite a few already and we welcome all members that are interested in reaching this goal um, to, to join the platform either as an ordinary member or supporting member. So supporting members can share, can use the platform as a means to share um, their information on this topic and to achieve high visibility. The platform also um, has support from major um, experts and renowned individuals in the field of uh, global sustainability, climate change, and renewable energy. Um, so we have Bill, McKib Bill McKibben um, from 350.org. We have David Suzuki um, from David Suzuki Foundation in Canada. We have Naoto Kan, who's the former prime minister of Japan, uh, who was prime minister when the Fukushima disaster happened. So he feels very strongly about this issue. Um, we have Michael Brun, Executive Director of Sierra Club in the US, uh, Monica Gandhi, who is a, a permanent member of the Indian uh, Parliament and uh, environmentalist, and Deepa Sibarua, who is um, a, a very strong pioneer in Bangladesh in the field of locally based solar energy facilities. Um, so at the, now I want to introduce you our uh, main tool in a sense that has been launched on Monday. And before I do that, I would quickly want to explain to you again our thinking in the last couple of years. We ask ourselves repeatedly, what does 100% renewable energy actually mean in different jurisdictions and for us? The question is, how do we implement it? We have in our, our platform um, many, um, many, many, many options and many um, uh, guidelines how to do this. And um, the question is, how do we assess progress towards 100% renewable energy? And also very importantly, how do we measure success? And even perhaps more importantly, who measures success? 
Um, for this, uh, in, in, in order to um, support actors who want to reach this goal in doing so and to creating a 100% renewable energy plan, um, we have come up uh, together with our members um, with the global 100% renewable energy building blocks. And this is especially targeted towards local governments who can, in their uh, respective constitu constituencies can apply this tool in order to create such a plan. Um, these are... Um, um, uh, adv advisory blocks in a sense um, and this tool is supposed to be uh, complementary to current and existing initiatives that already um, support local governments in this regard. What we do is we don't tell local governments you have to do this and otherwise you won't achieve the renewable energy um, transition or what you're doing is currently wrong. Instead um, we provide them with this um, um, with 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 advice, we advise uh, provide them with these uh, these blocks that that they then can um, in a sense individually adapt and choose what do they want to implement first, which advice do they want to implement first, and um, uh, and it's very important to stress that all of these different parts are uh, interconnected in a sense. So addressing one issue has implications on the other. So you can organize workshops in a sense and um, at local government level, for instance, and then engage and, and have people engaging in discussions with each other, um, with local stakeholders, how um, these bill blocks can be implemented. This is how it looks. Um, the uh, building blocks themselves are um, divided in smaller blocks in a sense and um, um, one very important uh, aspect uh, which comes uh, back repeatedly, which can be seen repeatedly uh, in these building blocks is that local governments are asked to first like map out what is the current situation with regards to um, what finances are available, what are the greenhouse gas emissions, how, many, how much renewables are there, and to what extent are uh, citizens um, actually uh, being um, engaged with, with, you know, in this process of coming up with this plan. And as you can see here, um, um, this nowhere does it say you have to do this, but it's uh, really up to people using this tool to choose what they want to address first and do so in the most effective way. Um, this is again a slide out how to use them. I already talked about it a bit. Um, it's very important to note, um, I think the most important part from this slide is to tell you that um, this tool can be adapted um, based on the respective um, context that different local governments have in their separate jurisdictions. Um, and um, w and uh, by doing so can effectively be, be customized as well. Um, another important part is monitoring. Um, the tool itself is uh, something that helps local governments achieving um, or the, create, the creation of such a plan. Um, and it can also be used for benchmarking in a sense and, and, and monitoring and evaluation in a sense. Um, but it's important to point out that benchmarking is not the most important part. And I can show you the reason for this. Um, this is uh, an example of how um, we think a local government or an institutionalized body can um, evaluate progress that uh, a local government, for instance, is making on um, on, on with regards to to these building blocks and with regard to creating such a plan. So if a local government is doing really well in with support to desanitization and inclusion, it can get five points. And uh, if it's doing uh, less well, for instance, in, with regard to increasing integrated renewable energy across all sectors, it gets two points in this case. So this is a very interesting way of visualizing the, the more holistic um, approach and how um, a local government is um, working. Uh, with, with regards to um, all of these different building blocks. Um, it, it's important to point out that it is, of course, difficult to say who is the person actually um, deciding whether or not the local government is doing a good job, right? And if you want to engage in global benchmarking, it might be, you know, the, the criteria might differ from, 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 um, from organization or local government to local government. So an idea perhaps might be to do this on a, um, within a, a smaller geographical area in which um, such um, criteria can then be set. Good. Um, so this has been uh, the uh, building blocks as the primary tool that are now currently, um, that we are carrying out into the world through the platform. 
and we look forward to doing this uh, much uh, more in the future. And uh, for further information, you can uh, go to the website um, and um, or our Facebook, Twitter, uh, where you can also find information not only on the building blocks, but also on the map that I showed, um, different documents um, with regard to uh, achieving um, this um, transition and also technical expertise and information, um, which is explained in the documents as well. Um, if you want to contact me personally, um, this is my email address. Um, as again, I'm the coordinator. And thank you very much. I will now give the uh, floor to Felix, who will comment uh, on behalf of ICLE. Thank you very much, Atta. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Felix Akrufi. I work with ICLE. Local Government for Sustainability, and uh, I work, I'm with the World Secretariat here in Bonn. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to um, highlight or re-emphasize a little bit on what has been shared here so far, and um, particularly from the perspective of our work in, in ICLE. So ICLE is um, an international association of local governments for sustainability. Oh, I'm sorry. That's it. Just a wake. Yeah, so ICLE is um, an, an international association um, for local governments for sustainability. We have about 1,500 um, cities, towns, and regions in our network and we support them on the path to sustainability. Um, all right, so ICLE is happy, is proud to be a member of the 100% Renewable Energy Campaign. And um, over the years, we have supported our cities in this respect, and more so, um, with respect to the new platform that has been launched, we support, we, we wish to extend this agenda ahead and encourage all our, all local governments we work with to um, continue in this respect. One tool that we have in-house is the Carbon Climate Registry. And with this, uh, it's, this is an international, this is a platform for local government to report their actions, their targets, and their performance in, of climate action. And um, with this tool, we are able, we also encourage them to, through this tool, they are able to voluntarily report their targets. Um, the platform is, offers tra transparency and recognition for local government action. And so um, by reporting on these two cities readily express or show what their pathways are, what they are doing in terms of um, climate action and more so in renewable energy. Um, the tool also fits into the NASCAR, NASCAR platform, which is the uh, non-state actor for climate, uh, non-state actor zone for climate action. And um, Carrying on, we the, the message we want to send here is that many cities already have re reported renewable, 100% uh, renewable energy, uh, renewable energy commitments in in on this tool already in the in in the CCR, the Carbon Climate Registry. About, currently, we have about 40% uh, commitments, 40 40 commitments. Um, to 100% renewable energy. And um, there's also 1,100 other commitments that are not 100%, but also it's, it's blended. And so we already see the kind of pathway or the momentum that has been built in this respect towards sustainable energy and um, particularly through the renewables. Um, Yeah, so uh, we would like to encourage the cities, all all the local our local governments, we would like to encourage them to continually uh, report 
their 100% renewable energy on the platform and follow the pathway, the pathways of um, Canada, uh, Vancouver in Canada, and Vecchio in Sweden. Um, that's all I will say. Thanks. Okay, well, thank you, Felix. Um, so um, this has been um, enough talking, I think, from our side. Um, so um, we currently have, um, uh, um, well, officially 15 minutes left um, to uh, engage in fruitful discussions. Hopefully, I'm very keen on trying out that blue cubist bowl thing with a microphone in there. Um, so we might um, throw that around if there's um, any questions from your side. Who wants to ask the first question? Then I'll jump at once. Let's see how it works. Is it working at all? Okay. Anyway, my name is John Noble. I'm from uh, WWF Denmark. And there's also a 100% uh, renewable energy initiative by business. And I wonder what your perspective is on, on that thing. So, um, if I may answer to that, uh, that is an initiative which uh, we, um, I, I'd say, is a, is a complementary initiative because it's kind of uh, um, companies that are committing themselves uh, while the 100% renewable energy so far campaign and platform um, is kind of uh, pushing on the international agenda. Um, uh, the 100% uh, this uh, 100% RE100, it is called, that's probably the one you refer to, um, is an organization of companies which have already said, we will go that way. So it's something uh, different, no? So we have also, um, we're in contact with them, uh, and it's certainly in line, uh, in general, with the um, goals of uh, this organization, which was launched on Monday. But we must see that the 100% kind of movement, if I may call it like this, is of course much, much broader. So these big companies, they play an important role also in public perception. In reality, we see that uh, it's many communities, individuals, small, medium-sized companies, it's um, civil society, it's science, which all play in a very important role. So we see each other as partners. Yeah, if I may make a comment on that as well. Um, it's from on behalf of Climate Action Network. So Climate Action Network uh, works uh, relatively closely with uh, the Climate Group, who is the entity behind the RE100. So uh, I alluded to that in my presentation. It is, is a conglomeration, or it's like a, a, um, a union of um, companies that get together and make commitments to 100% renewable energy. And as I mentioned before, it's companies such as IKEA, the Mars Group, Bloomberg and so forth. So it's quite substantial companies. Now, some of them have quicker and some of them have uh, slower implementation plans that are that are aligning with their, their commitments, but all of them are working towards 100% renewable energy. And obviously having big Fortune 500 companies speaking on our behalf is something that moves things in terms of, of um, speaking to decision makers and particularly investors. I just wanted to mention there are two other uh, large initiatives. One is called Women Business, and the other one is called uh, the B Team. And for the latter, it is more an initiative of um, uh, very iconic uh, companies. So this is driven by Richard Branson and Virgin Group of trying to convince other big companies to commit to renewable energy. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Shubha. I'm doing my master's with the uh, UNU EHS in Bonn. So I actually have two questions. Um, I was not very clear about the community power project, um, like how the, the local community can actually generate income uh, uh, from the renewable energy and how they can actually reinvest in it. And uh, the other question is, um, so I'm from India and uh, I've always wondered about this, like there is abundant solar energy in our country and still um, we're not actually using it to generate electricity. 
and um, I have also heard that there are a lot of challenges to install um, like solar power plants, maybe because of uh, the huge investment and uh, maintenance cost. So um, are these real challenges uh, and uh, could these be overridden and how? Well, the first part of your question was obviously for me. Would you like to specify for whom the second is? Um, yeah, anybody could answer. Like maybe uh, the one who spoke about solar energy. I think okay. Stefan. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, community power, how that works. Um, as you're studying in Bonn, obviously, you, you travel around Germany, around Europe. You probably see many wind farms. You see solar roofs. Uh, you see farms which have that you may be aware even there are cooperatives in solar cooperatives here in this region it's a uh, basically a, um, a quite simple concept it's the citizens who come together it's often in form of a cooperative they create a cooperative for example there's a cooperative here i think it's called um Burger Energie Siebengebirge, so this is the other side of the Rhine. They put some money together and then they build together, uh, invest the money in a solar panel or in a, in a solar installation. Um, this is uh, a typical example in the OECD countries. It's very common in Denmark that uh, even this is how it started in Denmark. Lasse, I think you're Danish also, you can talk more about it than I can. Uh, but it was initially even kind of limited to such kind of um, um, ownership models in the 1980s when the Danes started to invest on a large scale and actually laid the industrial basis for uh, the wind um, energy utilization. Um, in the developing country context, um, ownership, of course, can and should also be local. This is what we believe in because, uh, again, um, when we deploy renewable energy, there is an initial investment necessary. No? Uh, but that means that investment, also somebody in, is investing and then takes a profit out of that. Um, we see the challenge that the initial investment is a bit difficult in countries where the people, unless, I mean, uh, unlike here, they may not have 5,000 or even 500 or $100 to invest. Um, so there are different uh, challenges. Um, how people can become owners, but we also see some models like I think very famous Gramin Shakti, the microcredit model, the way how Gramin Shakti implemented it in Bangladesh, which provides a technology supply plus finance, and at the end, people are actually owners of that installation. But we do believe that the local ownership really is important to maximize that the profit also that comes from the investment stays within the local community. Is that more or less? Yeah. Okay. Um, do you need any further uh, explanation from, from my side, or did Stefan answer both of your questions? Yeah, I'm clear about this. All right. Well, glad I could <laughs> not say much. Anyway. Just want to add one thing about so being Danish, not currently based in Denmark, but nonetheless Danish. Um, oh, just wanted to mention one of the key drivers that actually kicked off the big uh, windmill adventure in Denmark was the energy crisis in the 1970s, the mid to late 1970s. So it wasn't, unfortunately, out of pure altruism and an effort to save the world. It was also out of necessity played a big role here. So one would also wonder that when we're seeing how the world is slowly falling apart impacts due to impacts of climate change that that necessity isn't really resonating with the investments in renewable energy yet but hopefully we'll get there hi um i'm simon from the youth alliance for future energy and my question would also regard to what uh, stefan Xenge said um about the um, new business model uh, in, or about the small investors being squeezed uh, because I come from Germany too uh, out of a region where wind energy <coughs> sorry is uh, very popular and I saw the benefits uh, which it brings to local communities and uh, Germany is about to switch its um, market model from uh, in, towards a tendering competition and I was wondering if the global trend you mentioned um, is uh, was it that what you what you wanted to say that uh, more countries um, tend to this model, and is it something we should raise awareness of because it's 
uh, getting more difficult for local communities to profit or to invest? Certainly, yes. I'm, I mean, the first one of the first countries which introduced feed-in tariff system or like feed-in tariff was certainly Denmark. But um, once Germany introduced it, it became very popular. And this is how we see uh, once Germany started to move away, uh, obviously that was an, a, a bad example in that case. And we see that many countries and we work with at the moment do a market study on Russia and we work a lot with Japan. Also, some of the developing countries like Pakistan, there is a, really a global trend towards auctions, which everywhere make it, makes it almost impossible, not only for communities, but for all small players. That includes small, medium-sized enterprises, which, for example, in Pakistan is the case where you have medium-sized. It's all, at the moment, almost all of them local businessmen who are investing, uh, mainly men, not so many women, but uh, they even will not be anymore in the position uh, to to uh, invest, unfortunately, then we don't know who will take over. But there's international uh, corporations, and in a country like Pakistan, uh, the question is: Then are these international corporations willing to take the country risk if it's not anymore uh, the the local um, SMEs that are? So yes, it is a is a big problem, and um, we're trying to kind of. But uh, we are all compared with some of the. Big corporations, very small organizations, uh, with also the funding that we have behind. But um, it is challenging, but we should find alternative solutions indeed. Four minutes left Four now, minutes. yes. Okay. So, <laughs> if anybody else has a question? Yeah. Throw it. It's, it's throw soft it, and it, yeah. safe. Do it. There you go. <laughs> Hello. My name is Hazri. I'm from Malaysia, Ministry of Energy. Uh, is there any risk of people losing their jobs or businesses when we shift from conventional to 100% renewable energy? And how do you think we should address that issue? Thank you. Well, that is a very good point. In my country in America, we are also facing the same thing. We have a president right now that wants to bring back coal and uh, cut down on the solar job. So I understand your, your question, and it's, and it's a very important one. Um, the answer is yes, some jobs will go away, but more jobs will be created from the loss of those jobs. Um, just as, as we used whale blubber to, and kerosene to heat our homes 200 years ago, those, that industry sh sh shifted. So we also have a shift, and yes, some jobs will go away, but new jobs will be coming up to, to fill that spot. So jobs, let's, let's, let's say jobs won't be lost, but they'll be transferred into a different skill set. But it's important um, for the countries that are shifting to provide training for these new jobs that coal miners can now learn how to install solar panels or, or build solar, solar, solar panels too. Um, I think it's, uh, um, of course, that is a matter that is more kind of an, a matter of concern for those countries which are at the moment maybe exporters of fossil resources. You look at the countries like Europe, I think an average import something like a thousand euros per capita per year. Um, then imagine that that means that Europe, European Union has an, an import of four or 500 billion euro expenses, which could stay in Europe. That's just as an example. Um, that of course uh, would give an additional boost to the economy even if that money stayed here. Of course, countries like Russia or Saudi Arabia, they are a bit worried about that. But I believe that all these countries have opportunities, so they must start soon. That's rather indeed something these countries have to take seriously. They must start soon to substitute and not be only uh, dependent on exporting gas or oil, because sooner or later the um, exports will slow down, that's for sure. They will not stop immediately to zero, but there will be a slowdown 
which will have a, an, a major impact on these countries. And I believe that the current rather low oil price has something to do with the uptake of renewable energy. So rather every country make yourself prepared and invest rather early in renewable energy to avoid that people get unemployed and make them fit to be prepared and find jobs. And every country can benefit at the end of the day, I'm sure. And just to, I agree with everything that was said. And just to supplement it, when you look at, at uh, developing countries, particularly, as I mentioned in my presentation, it's just not a matter of transition. It's a matter of developing uh, energy, like creating the energy access that is needed. And th there are many countries that are now at a crossroads of investing in, in coal, which has a very quick re return on investment. Let's be honest about this. And it's uh, some places the infrastructure is ready for it. But in a very short term, and particularly in the in the long, sorry, in the medium term, and particularly in long term, it's a very bad investment in the terms of health, in terms of job creation, retention, and of course climate change. So the we are at a tipping point now where we're seeing that uh, the, the kilowatt per hour is actually che cheaper to produce with with renewable energy in many places. And as soon as we see that, much more in terms of creating building new installations, and particularly in uh, third world countries, that is going to change things dramatically. Um, the missing point here uh, are investments because the big investors are currently not prepared or not knowledgeable enough to, to take the risk of uh, investing in renewable energy portfolios. They stick to what they know, which is mainly coal and oil. But this, the, so the, there's a big something to be said about trying to convince investors to, to, to leapfrog into to renewable energy investments, and that is going to change things dramatically. And as was pointed out, that is going to create many more jobs. Okay, thank you, Lasse. So I think um, with every good and productive side event comes a punctual finish and ending. Um, so we are right on time. Um, I would just quickly like to wrap up. Um, so I think we have shown in the side event today um, that uh, there are, this is not only one organization small calling for this goal, but this is many global organizations working on a global scale that are really working towards achieving this goal and now have this global 100% renewable energy platform that will work vigorously to promote this goal and to show that all uh, all the, to call the kind of expertise that all the, of the members of the entire world can contribute to this and can be put to use in the most effective manner. So I thank you very much for attending and also for your very productive questions. Um, I think all of us are um, as well um, open for questions uh, afterwards, um, but also you have our contact details. Um, so in case anything else would arise, please do not hesitate to contact us at all times. Thank you very much.